We are going to the moon. With NASA's Artemis campaign, we will explore the moon in new ways, travel vast distances, and discover more than ever before, all while learning how to live and work on another celestial body. A next generation lunar terrain vehicle will take us to places never visited by astronauts. Harsh landscape, extreme cold, and limited sunlight at the moon's south pole demand a truly off-road and off-planet vehicle. It will let us conduct science and locate new resources, and that will help us go deeper into our solar system. We're building on over five decades of experience, and this time it will operate with or without astronauts on board enabling continuous exploration and science on the lunar surface. We're sending a robust vehicle that can stand up to the challenges of the moon's south pole. For new discoveries, for places never explored, for the benefit of all. Welcome to the Artemis Generations Lunar Terrain Vehicle. Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. I'm Victoria Ugaldi. Today we have an exciting announcement to reveal the companies selected to move forward in developing the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, which will allow astronauts to explore more of the lunar surface during Artemis missions. We have some panelists here today who will be providing uh, remarks and answering some questions regarding the new award. With us today we have Vanessa Weich, Director of the Johnson Space Center, Jacob Bleacher, Chief Exploration Scientist at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C., Laura Kearney, Manager of the Extravehicular Activity and Human Surface Mobility Program here at the Johnson Space Center. We also have representatives of the awarded companies to provide remarks and address questions, but I will give the honors to Vanessa for announcing the selected companies. We'll first start with some initial remarks uh, from each of our briefers before opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as from here in the room. If you're here in the room, just raise your hand and we will get a microphone over to you. For those on our phone bridge, please press star one to enter into our queue. And with that, I will hand it over to Vanessa for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Good afternoon. NASA's Johnson Space Center is proud to continue exploration via NASA's Artemis Moon to Mars program. As the home to mission operations, astronaut training, human spacecraft development, systems integration, and program management of our premier NASA programs, I am pleased to talk about the accomplishments that happen here every day. At the Johnson Space Center, we are very proud of managing the International Space Station, where we are operating and conducting science 365 days of the year. And it not only benefits Earth, but it also is helping us with our exploration goals. Through the Artemis program, we will witness our nation's return to the lunar surface, this time establishing a sustainable human presence on the moon in preparation for missions to Mars. Building on commercial collaboration that started in low Earth orbit, we're fostering a commercial space economy with private sector and international partners. In view of this, I am pleased to announce, after a very thorough and rigorous procurement process, NASA is selecting three awardees to provide lunar terrain vehicle services. The awardees are Intuitive Machines, represented by Steve Altimus, CEO and co-founder, Lunar Outposts, represented by Justin Cyrus, CEO and founder, and Venturi Astrolab, represented by Jarrett Matthews, CEO and founder. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. This capability is being added to the other Artemis elements. The excitement here is tremendous as we are training our Artemis II crew for an upcoming test flight to the lunar vicinity next year. These will be the first humans to venture to deep space since 1972 at the close of the Apollo era. 
They will board an Orion spacecraft on top of a Space Launch System rocket and be launched from a mobile launch platform at Kennedy Space Center. Our astronauts, engineering, operations, and health and medical teams are working with other commercial and international partners on vehicle and systems that will support sustainable lunar missions. Johnson Space Center is proud to lead other critical elements of the Artemis architecture, including commercial lunar payload services that provides robotic exploration activities, Gateway, which is humanity's first space station around the moon, as well as our exploration-capable, commercially provided spacesuits. In support of future Artemis missions, Gateway will play a, a key role in helping NASA and its partners learn how to live sustainably on another body. The Orion spacecraft will dock with the Gateway and our astronauts will perform crew-tended operations while preparing for surface operations via commercially developed human landing systems. As astronauts explore the South Pole region of the moon during our Artemis missions, they'll be able to go farther and conduct more science than ever before thanks to the lunar terrain vehicle. Think of a hybrid of the Apollo-style lunar rover that was driven by our astronauts and an uncrewed mobile science platform. This will give the crew the capability to travel a distance much further from their landing sites. In addition, during uncrewed operations, the LTV will provide autonomous operations for science and technology. NASA and the Johnson Space Center workforce will continue to work closely with Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outposts, and Astrolab as they build the LTV, providing insight throughout the development and ensuring that the system is safe for our astronauts. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vanessa. I'll now hand it over to Jake. Thank you. And thank you for having us, Vanessa. This truly is a uh, exciting moment. So we're looking to the moon and continue to take steps with Artemis to build a blueprint for exploring space. I would like to congratulate Astrolab, Intuitive Machines, and Lunar Outpost for bringing forward your innovative and creative solutions that will provide new opportunity for exploration of the moon. I'd also like to congratulate Lara and her team I know they spend a lot of hard work, a lot of time and hard work to reach this point. Now, I would like to take a moment to ensure that we all recognize the importance of this announcement. If you'll indulge me for a moment, let's take a step back in our memory and try to remember a time when you were a child. Most likely, your world was as large as the range that you could move under your own power at that time. Now try to remember how it felt when you first gained the ability to move beyond the boundaries of that world. For me, that involved learning to ride a bike. Maybe for you it was something different, roller skates, roller blades, skateboard. Maybe it was a wheelchair, or maybe it was even access to public transit for the first time. Regardless of your technical solution, you could now reach places that were previously off limits to you. Enhanced mobility fundamentally changes one's world. It changes where you can go, it changes what you can do, quite simply it changes what you can learn. Science is our toolbox for learning and enhanced mobility is one of the most important tools in that science toolbox. Science itself is one of our fundamental reasons that we're going to the moon. Science will help us learn about the moon, about how we survive in space, and that will help us build that blueprint for exploring away from the Earth. The moon is a treasure chest of science that can unlock the secrets of our solar system and teach us more about our home planet for the benefit of all. The lunar samples returned from the Apollo program dramatically changed our view of the solar system, our place in its evolution. And scientists continue to this day to unlock new insights from those samples. The diversity of Apollo samples increased when the lunar roving vehicle enabled exploration of more surface area per mission. 
that diversity of lunar knowledge is what we seek now. Observations from previous robotic explorers in space and even an impact mission on the surface have proven that permanently shadowed regions on the moon, including some craters in the South Polar region, contain frozen water. Yet we are only scratching the surface of knowledge that the moon has to offer us. Future samples from Artemis missions will increase that diversity of our knowledge about the moon. The discovery of water on the moon holds promise for both science and human exploration. NASA wants to understand how much water exists below the surface and whether or not we can access it. Better understanding of the sources and concentrations of this water will help teach us how the moon formed and evolved and may provide resources for our future explorers. Under Artemis, NASA is sending robots and astronauts to explore more of the moon than ever before, including the lunar south pole where no humans have ever been. Crews will use the LTV to explore. They will transport scientific equipment, and they will collect samples from the lunar surface from much farther than they could if they were on foot alone. This will enable us to learn more science as we go. With the addition of the LTV, we are combining the best of human and robotic exploration. Between the Artemis missions, when our astronauts are not on the moon, NASA can use the LTV's remote operation capabilities to continue exploring. It means also that we'll be able to operate the LTV to meet our crew when they arrive on the surface. That means they'll be ready to go right away to focus on all the exploration that benefits the most from having our astronauts there. And then after the crew leave, the LTV can continue remote operations for additional exploration, prospecting, science, similar to robotic explorers that we have on Mars right now. This can help us identify priorities for our next crewed missions. With NASA's Artemis campaign, we are building up the capabilities needed to establish a longer term exploration and presence of the moon. And the LTV is one of those capabilities that will enable us to conduct more science as we explore. As we will learn to live farther away from home for longer periods of time than ever before, we will build the first long-term presence on the moon and inspire a whole new generation of scientists, engineers, astronauts, artists, and everything else. Mars remains a horizon goal, and what we learn here on the moon, both with our operations and how to interpret the science, that will help us when we're ready to take that next giant leap to Mars. Now, I like to imagine the views and the vistas that the LTV will enable us to see from the surface of the moon. This truly is an exciting next step in exploration. The LTV is truly an exploration vehicle. Where it will go, there are no roads. Its mobility will fundamentally change our view of the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And now we'll go to Laura Kearney. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so really excited to be here today. As was mentioned, our NASA team has been working really hard to get to this point. Started a couple of years back. It, it took us a little while to really understand the requirements for this vehicle and what it meant to ask a vehicle to operate on the moon in the lunar South Pole region full time, 24-7, 365 for up to 10 years. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were really getting the requirements set right when we put this request for proposal out. Um, we also wanted to make sure we truly understood our acquisition strategy. Um, as was mentioned, we want to make sure we are um, pushing the commercial industry forward and making sure we are establishing a robust lunar economy uh, on the moon. So it took us a little while to make sure we understood what that requirement set was. Once we got the RFP out, our procurement team really kicked in and they have worked really hard for the last year maintaining the schedule so that we could be here where we are today. Um, so I am really excited to have the three gentlemen sitting here to my left. Um, we've been waiting to this point where we can start engaging them as a program going forward. So a little bit about uh, the EVA and Human Surface Mobility Program. 
We are charged with delivering and integrating the EVA spacesuits that will be used to walk on the lunar surface, the LTV that we are here uh, to award today, and the pressurized rover. Um, together, these three elements will provide the first surface elements for the astronauts in the early Artemis missions. So we have a responsibility not only to deliver these elements on cost and on schedule, but to make sure they are integrated well and meeting all of the objectives of the Artemis enterprise as well as of our science community. So again, we're very excited now that we have these companies and these teams on board, we can better understand what their designs are and how they integrate into the infrastructure that, that we are charged um, to support for the Artemis enterprise. A bit about the structure of the contract, it is what we call a service contract. Um, so we have asked these companies not only to design, develop, and deliver a lunar terrain vehicle, um, but to also get that vehicle to the moon. So as part of their proposals, they propose not only the design of the LTV, but also how they launch it and how they will land it on the lunar surface. Um, each of their contracts will include that full scope, but they are not actually authorized to the, do the work until we have put a task order in place. And so by doing this, we will have competitive task orders throughout the life of the contract that ensures we maintain robust competition, we continue to get um, innovation, and we get the best value for the government and long-term commercial economy. So how we do that at the um, beginning is we have what we call a feasibility phase. It's a task order that each of these companies will get. It's about 20 or 12 months, I'm sorry, in duration and leads up to the preliminary design review. And so during that time, our NASA teams will be working with them to understand what their designs look like, iterating with them on where we can make improvements and understanding how they um, incorporate into our overall lunar architecture. Once we get past that point, we will have a, a follow-on subsequent competitive request for proposal go out. Well, they, will then they will then compete for what we call a demonstration task order. That demonstration allows them to finish, finish the development, get the LTV to the moon, and demonstrate it on the surface prior to the arrival of the Artemis V crew. We anticipate only being able to award that demonstration task order to one of these companies. Once that demonstration is complete, we'll then move on to what we call service task orders. And that will be an annual cadence where we will work with our Artemis um, Enterprise customers as well as our science customers. And on an annual basis, we will award a service contract for them to provide both crude and uncrewed un services throughout the remaining life of the contract. Um, so again, we are really, really excited. Our congratulations to the three companies from our team. Um, we are looking forward to jumping in with you guys and certainly making LTV um, a big success. Thank you, Laura. We will now hear remarks from each of the selected companies in alphabetical order, starting with Steve Alsimus of Intuitive Machines. Steve? Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here um, and uh, receive this award on behalf of our Moon Racer team, which is the uh, reusable um, let me write this down here. It's a reusable autonomous crewed exploration rover team. Our team is made up of uh, AVL, Boeing, Michelin, Northrop Grumman with Intuitive Machines as a prime. So we're very excited. I remember about uh, a month ago, I was in this room in a press conference celebrating a successful soft landing on the moon. And this next step, this LTV award, is just an exciting next step to put the most critical piece or the first critical piece of infrastructure on the surface. Um, we're going to need this world-class team to do that because, you, as you saw in the video, um, the environment on the moon is harsh. You know, we have 500 degree temperature swings. The South Pole region is rocky and craggy and, and, and shadowed. Uh, it's going to stress our suspension, our drivetrain, our power systems and our autonomous driving algorithms and software. And we're going to need this globally integrated team to pull that off to allow this rover to live for 10 years and provide the service um, that NASA is asking for. Uh, I think what's really important also is to applaud NASA for this non-traditional forward-thinking procurement. 
It really is exciting that not only are we going to support the Artemis campaign with crewed missions and uncrewed missions, but also it's commercially available for us as a commercial business to sell capacity on that rover and, and do that for international partners and for other commercial companies and space agencies around the world. So this is another first, this LTV contract in a burgeoning cislunar economy. And I'm really happy to represent our Moon Racer team and to be here and uh, appreciate NASA's, uh, NASA's award. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Steve. Next up is Justin Cyrus with uh, Lunar Outpost. Hi, my name's Justin Cyrus and I'm the CEO and founder at Lunar Outpost. For those of you who don't know who we are, Lunar Outpost is the leading mobility provider in the world. We have four rovers that are headed to the lunar surface. First one this year, uh, later as a part of the IM2 mission. Uh, shortly after, we'll be a part of the IM3 mission going to Reiner Gamma and a commercial mission to follow and an international collaboration from there as part of the Australian Space Agency's Trailblazer program. So I'm honored to be here representing our company, but also our amazing team. So our team consists of Lockheed Martin, General Motors, MDA Space, and Goodyear, who are all providing critical components of this overall contract. Now, our team combines proven human and robotic heritage, which is extraordinarily difficult to come by, and we're very fortunate to have as a part of our group. And what we're doing is taking not only the space heritage, but we're taking cutting edge technology and automotive industry strengths to provide a true off-road vehicle capable of allowing us to live and work on the surface of the moon. With a strong focus on commercialization and enabling the new cislunar economy, our team is well positioned to help NASA take the next leap. As a part of the Artemis campaign, our LTV design emphasizes astronaut safety alongside groundbreaking new capabilities that enable new mission profiles, including notably enhanced science mission returns, alongside building and maintaining infrastructure on the surface of the moon. I am uh, truly humbled to be here on stage uh, at Johnson Space Center, where uh, as a kid, I grew up right down the street, watching the people of this center and watching the people of NASA continue to constantly push boundaries and explore new horizons. And that spirit of constantly pushing, uh, improving and exploring is what's led me to be here on this stage today. So first of all, thank you uh, for that inspiration. And I really hope I am able to be a part of this program and inspire the next generation. Now, uh, I do also wanna thank NASA and Johnson Space Center for letting us have the opportunity to get humanity back to the moon and on to Mars, hopefully this time to stay. And I will do my best and our team will do our best to make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. We'll now hear from Jarrett Matthews of Venturi Astrolab. Jarrett. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. Astrolab is on a mission to move humanity forward by building and operating a fleet of multi-purpose planetary rovers for transporting crew, supporting science and exploration, and robotic cargo logistics on the moon and eventually Mars. Uh, first, I would like to express my deep gratitude to NASA for giving us this opportunity to work alongside you uh, on the LTVS project and to the Astrolab team for working so hard for years on the LTV design and for putting together such a, a strong proposal. The Astrolab team is comprised of many incredible individuals with decades of experience in human spaceflight, uh, mobility, and planetary robotics, and I'm so proud of them today. I would also like to thank our LTVS team members, Axiom Space and Odyssey Space Research, who are bringing to the team their deep experience in crew interfaces, crew training, flight software, simulation, safety and mission assurance, and mission operations. And finally, our strategic partners at Venturi who are bringing their cutting edge advancements in electric mobility, energy storage, and lunar tire design. Astrolab has been working for over four years on our commercial platform called the Flexible Logistics and Exploration Rover, or FLEX. FLEX is designed to operate on the moon for years and is purpose-built to help establish a permanent human presence on the moon and to serve as a catalyst for the lunar economy. The first commercial version of FLEX is scheduled to land on the moon in late 2026 with up to one and a half tons of commercial cargo. 
The, the mission will allow us to validate our strong commercial model prior to sending the, L, the Flex LTV for NASA's Artemis campaign. Everything NASA has ever accomplished has been because they can assemble great teams, and that's exactly what we've done at Astrolab. So on behalf of everyone uh, involved with our team, we are honored, humbled, and so very much forward looking, uh, looking forward to working with NASA to deliver the most capable and versatile rover the world has ever seen. Thank you. All right, and thank you to all of our briefers for those initial remarks. We'll now move on to the question and answer portion of today's news briefing. Um, for all media, both here in the room and uh, on our phone bridge, please remember to state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question to. Um, and with that, oh, and for those who are in the room, just, just raise your hand. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, Eric Berger with the Ars Technica. Thanks for doing this. Uh, question for Laura. Um, you talked about a 12-month feasibility phase, um, and then there's going to be a competitive RFP. I just want to understand how you're going to maintain competition, but also it sounds like there's just going to be one team building one rover, LTV, that actually gets to the moon um, for this program. And so at what point do you cut from three to one, and, and how long does that last? It seems like it's going to be a fairly brief competition in that sense. The current plan, again, a lot of it is based on available budget. And so right now the intent is to just run this feasibility phase through the 12 months, as I mentioned, and at that point, one demonstration. Um, but that said, this contract mechanism is extraordinarily flexible. We can bring task orders onto this mechanism at any time. So depending if another use comes in, um, we can certainly turn on another task order for another development or service um, effort. And we also have an on-ramp clause that allows other companies to come onto this contract in the future should they have capability. Um, so really it is a matter of objectives, uh, requirements. If we have customers that come with additional funding, uh, we have a contract mechanism that will allow co companies to continue to compete for future demonstrations and service periods. Okay. Thank you for that question. Um, and just as a reminder, for those on our phone bridge, please press one to enter into our queue. And if you found that your question has already been answered, please press star two to uh, withdraw at any time. And with that, we'll take another question here in the room. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mark Carreau with Aviation Week and Space Technology. I have a kind of a few technical questions. And I don't know whether you've specified this yet, but, um, if you could explain how how these guys are supposed to be powered, um, what their range could be, and then maybe you could just describe the kind of environment uh, at the lunar south pole that these will be experiencing in terms of thermal and maybe radiation and other major factors. Thank you. And maybe perhaps I could start with high level requirements and then you gentlemen certainly can can jump in. We tried very hard in this requirement set to not be um, too dictative. We wanted to give just high level functional requirements, but with uh, an understanding of what the environment is. One of the big challenges at the Lunar South Pole is power, um, given that we are in shadow quite often. So the NASA team had done a lot of analysis to try to understand how we would navigate to an area where we continue, where we could get to areas where the sun can get, get to the rover and we can at least have some kind of um, power that way. We had derived a certain number of hours, a minimum number of hours that we put on this contract, um, we, but we did not limit and we did not define how these systems had to be powered. So they were able to provide innovative solutions and certainly able to provide what I would call excess capacity. If they could, for instance, meet 150 hours and it allows us to stay in darkness longer, that just provides more operational flexibility for us. Um, so that is absolutely one of the driving requirements. Um, as far as thermal, it was mentioned we can swing hundreds of degrees one way or another once, you know, beyond being in the sun to being um, in the shaded area. Uh, radiation is a big one uh, to be able to keep electronics alive in that environment. 
We have asked the companies to meet a 10-year operating life. We did not define how they needed to do that. I use polar examples just to prove a point. They could, for instance, come in and say, I'm going to deliver one rover, it's going to last 10 years, or I'm going to deliver 10 rovers that only last one year. And that way they have the trade space to say, maybe I can fly COTS electronics, but I'm going to have to replace them once a year. Or I have to be extraordinarily robust because I'm going to last 10 years. Those are bounding cases. None of them proposed either of those. But we wanted to be able to give them, again, these high-level requirements, and then they could innovate on how they wanted to solve those problems. I'm happy to hop in. So our company and our team more broadly has some pretty cool technology around this. It's a big part of what we're actually figuring out over the course of our first four rover missions to the lunar surface, basically how to squeeze every last watt of power out of these battery systems and conserve that energy for as long as we can. So on our first rover mission, we're just lasting the lunar day, which is a much easier challenge to solve than what we're doing here as a part of LTVS. Second rover mission, all right, now you can start looking at potentially lasting a couple lunar nights. By the time you get to the third and fourth rover missions, then we're looking at operating months at a time, all the way up to years at a time, depending on how those technologies are tested. Another member of our team that we're extraordinarily excited to have is GM. Uh, so that's something that they are providing as a part of uh, this overall LTVS program is their new battery technology that comes with much higher energy density that can survive the extremes of the lunar surface. Of course, with a little bit of modification, but it's truly amazing energy storage technology that we're very proud to be uh, bringing into the Artemis program. So uh, our team over at GM will be providing our battery technology, and then uh, Lockheed Martin and Lunar Outpost will basically be figuring out how to make the most of that technology moving forward so we can not only survive the lunar night, but truly operate for many years at a time during the lunar day and lunar night. All right, thank you. Before we go to our phone bridge, we'll take one more question here in the room. Hi, Beverly Casillas for Space Scout. Um, and I guess this one's also for Laura. Um, what kinds of knowledge and resources is NASA sharing with uh, these providers to kind of help accelerate the development of their um, of their concepts? We've seen like with XEVAs, um, you know, NASA provided things like the uh, XEMU data, um, as well as resources like the Argo system to help with testing and gravity environments. Could you provide any information about what kind of resources uh, EHP is providing? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we are using a very similar model to what we had on, uh, we call it XEVAS, it's the EVA acquisition. Uh, we've had a lunar LTV team uh, working within our engineering directorate here at Johnson Space Center for quite some time. Um, building t prototypes, understanding requirements, trying to get an idea of what these systems might look like. And we make all of that data available to these companies in a technical library for them to, to use and learn from and leverage from. Uh, so all that data is available. As we execute this contract, uh, we will have a NASA, what we call Insight Team, which will work side by side uh, with these companies, again, providing lessons learned and information back and forth. Um, and then also similar to our EVA contract, we will utilize what we call government task agreements. And so as part of their proposals, they actually provided, we uh, gave them information on what kinds of assets, uh, whether it be a testing facility, um, materials, certain knowledge that we have here at the Johnson Space Center, and actually um, all centers across the agency. We made that available to them so that they could then propose back to us where they would like to use those capabilities um, as part of their overall proposal. So certainly Johnson Space Center here has a lot of facility capability. Um, zero gravity or lunar gravity offloading systems that we anticipate um, them to use. We have some virtual simulation capabilities we anticipate them to use. And then of course this is where we will be bringing um, the spacesuits in and integrating the human element along with our, our crews and our engineering test subjects. Um, and so all that capability is being made available to them as they go through the development process. Uh, yeah, I, I'd answer that too. For <clears throat> Intuitive Machines and our team, uh, we've made extensive use of the GTA process that NASA offered across multiple centers. And whether that's Ames Research Center for autonomous uh, uh, driving, path planning, 
Uh, they have some great algorithms that do that, and whether it's Goddard Space Flight Center for uh, communications, or whether it's Johnson Space Center for the Argos gravity offload system. So there's quite a bit of capability in the agency which we plan to leverage. That was part of our proposal and priced accordingly. So this is really going to be a government and private sector partnership that builds this LTV and delivers it to the surface. We, we've actually been testing our lunar tire prototype here at Johnson Space Center for the last year, as well as uh, at NASA Glenn. Uh, through the NASA Announcement of Collaborative Opportunity uh, Program. So separate from LTV, but um, uh, that technology is going to be uh, applied to, the, to LTV. All right, thank you. And just as a reminder, if you are online on our phone bridge, please press star one to enter into the queue to ask your question. And with that, we will go to Jeff Faust with Space News. Good afternoon. Uh, a couple of quick questions for Laura Carney. What is the uh, dollar value of these initial task orders the three companies are getting? And then also, how many proposals did NASA receive for the solicitation? Thanks. Um, I think I am probably going to have to pass on both of those since we are technically still in a blackout period with these companies. Um, so once that blackout period is over and uh, source selection statements are released, I think that, that informate, some of that information, at least, will be available to you. All right. Thank you, Laura. We'll take another question on our phone bridge. Uh, Kenneth Chang with the New York Times. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, so the question is, um, how much time will there be for other customers to use the LTV, and how does the coordination go between NASA and the commercial customer? If, no, if NASA needs the rover at a certain place for the next Artemis mission. So we thought about that a lot, actually, and how we developed this RFP. We had to um, really strategize on different models for how we might establish those agreements. We understand at least, uh, we believe, in the early phase, NASA is going to have to be somewhat of an anchor tenant. And then we hope that over the the tenure operating life of this vehicle, we can start bringing in more and more and more commercial, um, I guess, requests as the market in, evolves. So we, as I mentioned, we will have these one-year service periods. And we started a model where the first service periods tend to be more NASA requirement driven. Um, so NASA, either through our science requirements or our exploration requirements, will carry about 75% of the burden or so, freeing up about 25% of the capacity for other commercial uses. Um, we have other um, mechanisms on the contract where as we go over time uh, and NASA perhaps becomes less and less of a user, we can open up more and more of that capacity uh, for the commercial space. Um, we also put processes on the contract where we have science and utilization teams that come in and they help us understand what their objectives are. We have joint agreements with the companies where we can get together and say over the course of this next year, these are what our objectives are, um, this is the mission that we want to meet. Um, and, the, and NASA ultimately, even though this is a commercial service, um, especially when it comes to crewed missions uh, and crew safety is paramount, NASA still has mission authority um, and risk acceptance over how this vehicle is operated on the lunar surface. So we have set up um, through the contract structure a lot of that I would call governance and authority infrastructure to make sure that we are collaborating with the vendor um, both on mission objectives and on uh, crew safety and uh, vehicle reliability. And if I may, we're really excited about NASA's services approach. Uh, that allows companies like ours and like the others on stage here today to start bringing more people into the system or economy. Uh, something, you know, that not widely talked about, we're not a public company, so we don't have to disclose this, but we're actually a majority commercial revenue company. Uh, as a space company, that's called Lunar Outpost, right? That, that doesn't exist 10 years ago. That doesn't exist 15 years ago. 
But through these new opportunities that NASA is providing to companies like ours, we are able to bring in those non-traditional space customers, international space agencies that are part of the Artemis Accords, and also a new block of new space companies that are helping drive value in the ecosystem. So it's been really exciting. Uh, two out of our first four missions are actually fully commercial, uh, where one is NASA and uh, uh, then the fourth one is an international space agency. So we're really looking forward to trying to scale that as part of the LTVS program, and we're very excited about the opportunity to bring some more people into the overall ecosystem. All right, thank you, Justin. We'll now take another question on our phone bridge. Uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Mark Rowe's question earlier, uh, trying to get a general sense of, of some of the at least aspirational goals each company has. Uh, for example, I mean, you know, what kind of ranges are we talking about? I realize you don't have a solid answer to that yet, but maybe can you bound it for us at least? I assume all three are solar powered. Are you envisioning solar panels on the vehicle for recharging or some kind of charging station? And, and maybe anything you can tell us about tire technology. We're, we're all familiar with Apollo 17 and the, and the kind of wheels they had back then, but what are we looking at now? Um, and I, I realize you don't have specifics perhaps for us, but just give us some general ideas of what you're looking at. Thanks. Well, let me, inter let me interject here, um, Bill. You know, a lot of this is competitive, right? Um, so what we did was we crafted um, feasible existence proof of, the, of a design to meet the uh, RFP requirements. We are going to go through a year-long process now to get to what Laura said was essentially a PDR design for the delivery to the South Pole and also for the demonstration mission uh, for that LTV. There's a number of the subsystems that we've uh, put in as the initial design that will be traded over that 12-month period that will give us a better understanding of things like survive the night, operate during the night, how effective um, solar arrays are versus fuel cells, uh, what the drivetrain needs to look like, what the battery life extensions are, what the suspension needs to be. And tires in particular, we work brought Michelin on board, who's done extensive work on lunar tires with the Glenn Research Center. And so that research has been going on for years. And so a lot of this work uh, we have answers to, uh, even our sparing tra um, uh, strategies that will allow us to extend the range and, gr and gain greater and greater capability out of this LTV as we learn about it and refine the design. And that's what this first design development uh, season of 12 months is all about. So I don't want to give you specific numbers because we will work as hard as we can to exceed the requirements that the government has asked us to do. Because it's in our best interest as a commercial business to um, have more capability to provide to commercial and international partners. Yeah, I mean, as, as Steve said, it's a competition, so <laughs> holding the numbers a little bit close, but I can say uh, Goodyear Tire Technology, absolutely awesome. Um, I'm really excited to see how they can bring some of the technology that we're using as a part of LTVS back down here to Earth. Uh, I want a set of those tires for my own off-road vehicle, uh, but hopefully you'll see some cool pictures. And I do think we have uh, them in our render as well, so uh, ha happy to share that publicly. But the tire technology truly is a step forward for exploring other planetary bodies. Yeah, and I'll just say uh, at Astrolab, we, we're a very hardware-rich, uh, iterative design approach kind of company, and uh, we, we built a full-scale, fully functional terrestrial prototype over two years ago now and have been doing thousands of hours of testing in, in the field with it. Uh, we frequently take it out to the Death Valley area in California, uh, and that has allowed us to stress the hardware uh, and actually try out our tire prototypes in the real-world environment as well as in our, our uh, environmental chambers that we have uh, at our company. And uh, so our tire technology has actually already been in thermal vacuum chambers. Uh, it's at an, it's on, currently on an endurance test rig at, at NASA Glen. Um, and so we're coming into this with a, a, a lot of um, experience already with, with uh, the technologies we're, we're planning to apply here. Um, like like our, our, my colleagues here, or um, the others on the stage here, um, you know, we intend to ex exceed NASA's requirements. Uh, I can tell you, you know, some of those requirements are that it travel 15 kilometers an hour, that it be able to traverse uh, um, 
20 kilometers in a, in a charge um, and um, you know be able to support a full eight hour EVA so all those all those are the base level requirements and, and again it's our intention to exceed those uh, by, by quite a lot in most instances all right thank you Jarrett we'll now take another question here in the room hi this is Eric Berger again uh, question for either Jer Jacob or, or Laura um, I just want to get a sense from you of, of whether you think the commercial space industry is ready, ready to step up to this challenge. I mean, the initial lunar rovers, you know, from Apollo lasted for a few days, and, and now you're asking for something to last for 10 years in a, in a very harsh environment, harsher than where the, the Apollo missions were. Um, and, and so that's like a really a huge kind of a quantum step. And so first question is just give me a little bit of philosophy about why you think that sort of the industry is ready to take that step. And secondly, I just want to confirm, this is planned to be land prior to the third human landing on the moon, probably Artemis V, but it's just to be for the third human mission. Is that right? So I'll ask, answer the second um, part. So again, under this contract, they have proposed their own mechanism for landing on the moon. So it is not really tied to the Artemis human missions. Um, our objective and our plan is to have an LTV on the surface prior to the Artemis V crew arrival. Um, if they can get there earlier, we'll take it earlier. If it's there for the Artemis IV crew, all the better. And certainly as soon as it's on the surface, it can start doing unmanned teleoperated science. So, so again, we're not fundamentally linked and tied to the, a specific Artemis mission necessarily. Um, as far as whether they're up to the challenge, um, again, I mentioned we spent quite a bit of time gathering industry data through requests for information, um, trying to understand where we thought the state of the art was, what their capabilities were. Um, I, I know we're asking a lot of these companies, um, but I think as you hear these gentlemen talk, I think they're, they're up to the challenge, um, and we are certainly here to help them be successful. Yeah, Eric, I would add a comment to that in terms of a burgeoning cislunar economy or commercial economy. You know, if you dovetail this with the commercial lunar payload service contract, we now are set for an annual cadence of mission deliveries to the surface of the moon. We've had our first successful mission. We'll have another one this year um, and another one early next year probably. Um, that sets up for that delivery and building off of the core of that um, uh, that experience, we can continue to evolve the lander technology to the point where we can get a reliable de delivery system called Nova D, which takes 1,500 uh, metric tons to the, or I'm sorry, 1.5 metric tons to the surface in the South Pole. So delivery is there, right? And we'll be there building on what NASA's already done to uh, instigate the commercial market. Now, the stressor requirement that Laura um, and her team put out about the 10 year survival. Uh, can be solved in many, many different ways. And so thinking innovatively about how to do that, uh, dovetailing that with a sparing strategy. Now, if you have a regular cadence of missions, you already have a commercialization plan where we're seeking commercial business um, to, to, to augment what the government anchor tenant is. And then you say, on top of that, um, I can deliver, I can deliver spares, I can deliver additional rovers, whatever it needs to survive that 10-year requirement versus do I have to invent something brand new where every component, including bearings and suspension and batteries, survives 10 years. So some of that thinking's gone in and, and you just haven't seen in, in the proposals. Yeah, and I, I agree with Steve wholeheartedly. I, I think because LTVS exists as a part of the Artemis ecosystem, we are able to leverage those other opportunities, whether it's part of the CLIPS program to prove out heritage on the surface of the moon, or whether it's to leverage high degrees of heritage uh, of our partners and that testing that we can do here on the lunar surface that's gonna happen as a part of these other programs uh, as well. And that's something Apollo didn't have. When Apollo was putting the LRV on the lunar surface, it was the first time that rover was on the lunar surface. First time most of that technology was on the surface of the moon. So if we're able to test out not only uh, the tires, which I mentioned earlier, Goodyear tires, 
uh, on, in a vacuum here on Earth, but if we're able to put them on the surface of the moon, understand exactly how they interact with that regolith and what that wear is gonna be like over time, that provides us a lot more data and a lot more knowledge on how to meet these very difficult requirements uh, that are a part of the LTBS program. So because of that Artemis ecosystem, that really allows us to have a much higher degree of confidence once we put this LTV on the lunar surface. Yeah, and I would just like to commend NASA for your process here. Um, uh, maybe people aren't aware, but the first request for information for this program came out in early 2020. There was another one in 2021, a draft RFP, et cetera. Uh, and we were engaged in that conversation all along, and um, and, they, and NASA has really, I think, taken to heart the industry input, uh, not, not just on the technological limitations and the requirements, but on uh, the commercial constraints that we're operating under and, and allowing for commercial activity on these missions. So um, really appreciate that. Uh, we have a, a similar strategy where, you know, we've, we've already signed a, an agreement to go to the moon in 2026 to, to prove out our commercial model, and we've last year announced uh, a number of companies who have um, signed up to go with us on that mission. And, uh, and that, that mission, of course, will, will be a precursor to, to, to LTVS and, and, um, and allow us to learn and, and, uh, and, and improve uh, the system before uh, it serves the Artemis campaign. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit about your point about the harshness of the environment. Um, there are some areas in the polar regions that are extremely harsh. There are permanent shadows where we never see sunlight. Uh, but there are other aspects to the South Pole that we understand because of the observations we've made over the last several decades. We've had the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, looking at the moon for since 2009. Um, we've learned a tremendous amount. And so I think we need to be careful when we talk about the South Pole as being harsher than, than elsewhere on the moon. There are some aspects, and the reason we're going to the South Pole is that there are some attributes that make it a little bit easier. So we often hear talking about surviving the, the day. Well, a lunar day in the South Pole can be hundreds of Earth days depending on where you go. That's the knowledge that we have learned over the last several decades that really enables us to take advantage of the lunar environment to our benefit. That data helped us develop requirements. It's the same data that's available to all of our teams to also determine how they want to go about this. And I thank them for bringing their innovation and creativity to this. That's why we're approaching this the way we are. We want to hear these different solution sets uh, so that we can take advantage of the moon. So instead of viewing the moon as a harsh environment that's difficult, um, I would suggest that maybe we view the advantages we can we can use to our benefit at the polar region. Um, again, that lighting, it, it can be hard if you go into the dark places, but it can be easier if we are taking advantage of places with longer access to light. And so I think with the knowledge we have gained, the knowledge that's available to them, you know, I'm confident in what we can do moving forward. All right, thank you, Jake. We'll take another question here in the room. Hi again, thank you. Um, so with the understanding that we're early in the design phase, um, many features may be uh, subject to change. You know, maybe you don't want to show all your cards just yet. Um, but if you could, you know, what newer innovative capabilities uh, is each provider most excited about providing with their design? Um, and how do you see that, you know, helping your vehicle contributing to that sustainable lunar presence in the long term? I'll, I'll, I didn't hear the, the whole question. Go ahead, jump in if you did. Sorry. Yeah. So, what capability are you most excited about providing that may be new or innovative um, or different, uh, if you can share? Um, and how do you see your design contributing to that sustainable presence in the long term? For me, I, uh, I'll, I'll lead off and have my uh, fellow awardees talk. But, uh, you know, I have a strategy in the Tuna Machines um, where we don't necessarily aggregate all the risk into a single launch. So what, by providing um, components at a certain size in, a, in an economy, you can actually um, uh, make more progress along the way. So like I talked with Eric's question about an annual cadence of missions, we can talk about resupply, we can talk about delivery of components and delivery of systems that feed the broader ecosystem or the broader economy. So if you have an SLS or a Starship launch to the surface, you tend to aggregate risk in that one vehicle. In this case, what we do is build a cargo variant 
like your regional delivery in aircraft or your or your amazon regional vans that deliver packages to your house a tractor trailer doesn't pull up to your house and deliver your package a regional van does and so taking that regional delivery uh, approach and architecture means that we've lowered the risk for nasa we've lowered the cost of access to the lunar surface um, and we've actually allowed more participants in the lunar economy and that's what i'm more, most proud of yeah, so I, I think the, the aspect of our design that I'm most excited about, and, and it's, it's in the name, uh, Flex, uh, is we have a, a, a novel modular payload capability, and that allows us to change out different cargo, different implements, um, uh, different customers, and serve a multitude of, of use cases, uh, again, to, to really serve as a catalyst for the lunar economy. You know, uh, the lunar uh, surface is going to need not just rovers, it's going to need power generation, power ge distribution, landing pads, um, berms, roads, habitation, et cetera. And we're, we're developing a platform that can support all of those use cases as we go forward. Um, I, uh, prior to starting Astrolab, I, I, I worked at SpaceX and worked uh, on, on Starship and really got excited about the, that capability and just the sheer tonnage that we'll, we'll soon uh, be able to, to bring to the lunar surface, not only with, with Starship, but the other um, uh, Eclipse landers and, and uh, the other HLS landers in work. And, and so soon, uh, access to the lunar surface is going to transition from, you know, once a decade, a few tens of kilograms to, you know, once a month, hopefully, with hundreds of tons. And, and so we're at a, a point in history now where you can actually start to contemplate industrial scale activity happening at the lunar south pole and and, and we're trying to build the platform to support it and, and i'll chime in i think my fellow awardees spoke pretty awesomely about the opportunity that's ahead of us if we do this right um, to talk to your question about technologies that we're most excited about i mentioned the batteries earlier i, I think that's a critically important part to solve as part of the whole artemis ecosystem not just the ltvs uh, program. So we're very excited about those. Those are coming from GM. I talked about the tires, but two of them that I didn't mention, and these are actually quite cool, and these are driven by the requirements that NASA provided. Uh, one requirement we have is we can't have more than 10 meters air on the lunar surface at any given time. This is without any infrastructure in place. We don't have GPS satellites around the moon. We don't have communication infrastructure. And we have to understand our environment and understand our vehicle dynamics to a point that we know exactly where we are on the lunar surface. And now that's not only critical for astronaut safety, but that is going to be a pretty awesome technology that I think we can bring back here to Earth that hopefully helps drive the adoption of autonomous cars in the future, that helps uh, drive forward self uh, driving cars and vehicles, not only on the roads, but in some of these unconstrained and uh, undefined environments. So that's, that's the third. The fourth is remote operations. Now, this is something that's been a pretty difficult problem to solve in the mining and the resources industry more broadly. Um, remote operations during that teleoperation phase of the LTBS program has to be pretty clean, right? You can't be dropping frames, you can't be dropping packets, you have to be able to operate this vehicle with confidence because this is, you know, a, a pretty expensive asset on the surface of the moon, but at the same time, it's pretty critical to all of our commercial business plans to have this operating for years at a time on the lunar surface. So you don't want to hit a rock, right? <laughs> that's, that's not something you want to do. So you have to be able to operate uh, in a way that provides that situational awareness remotely driving here on Earth or be able to operate autonomously on the surface of the moon. Uh, one thing cool that Lunar Outpost just did last week is remotely operate the Australian Trailblazer rover um, from here in the United States. That was actually from our Colorado offices, which we were extraordinarily excited about. So we're starting to take uh, bites off of those critical technologies that need to be a part of this LTVS program before we've even really gotten started here. But I, I do applaud the NASA team for putting these requirements in place to help push forward the cutting edge technology. Because there's a lot of cool tech coming out of this. Awesome. All right, thank you. We'll now go to our phone bridge with Will Robinson-Smith of Space Flight Now. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking our questions today. Really appreciate it. Uh, question for uh, Laura Kearney, if I may. 
I uh, believe Toyota is also developing its own human version of a, a lunar cruiser rover. So I was curious, was that factored into the award decision today, or is that operating on a completely separate contract that will eventually weave into the Artemis program down the road, so to speak? Thanks. Yeah, I believe I, I, you broke up just a bit at, at the beginning. I believe you asked about Toyota and the lunar, lunar cruiser. Is that what I heard you say? It was, yes. Okay, okay. Um, yes, again, um, kind of back to where I started. Again, we have within the scope of uh, my program both this unpressurized rover, which the LTV is, and uh, the pressurized rover. And the lunar cruiser that you see, uh, if you go Google it on the internet uh, here with Toyota, is a pressurized vehicle. Um, both of those assets, we are. Uh, Managing within my program, the idea is that they work together um, as a part of, again, a lunar system uh, to support the crew. Where the LTV is unpressurized, um, it will likely be more limited in its range. A pressurized rover, when it comes along with the life support, will be able to extend the crew's range um, even farther away from a lander. So our concept is that the unpressurized LTV and the pressurized vehicle work um, together in some type of operational concept uh, to support the crews and, and the scientific missions. Um, I'm probably going to leave it at that. I would just mention uh, we do have an announcement uh, about a week from now um, related to the pressurized rover. So we'll be able to talk to you a little bit more about that in about a week or so. All right, thank you. We'll take our next question from Marsha Smith with space, SpacePolicyOnline.com. Uh, thanks so much for taking my question. It's for Laura. Uh, the press release says that the combined maximum potential value of this is $4.6 Could you talk about the time frame that covers? Is that between now and 2029 when you expect Artemis V to land? Because that's sort of like when you're thinking of the first one will land. and how much of that is for this initial one year uh, part of the effort? Uh, yes, yeah, so that, so the life of the contract, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it and I'm hoping I'm going to get it right. I'm going to look right at my source board chair. But um, so we set the, it's quite a long contract. It's up to 15 years and it is based on a five year development um, plus the 10 year operating phase that we've been talking about. So that contract value number that you see covers the entire um, contract scope over 15 years. Um, and it, don't confuse contract value necessarily with budget. It's just a number that is on this con uh, contract that we can go, we are authorized to put these task orders out um, up to as uh, objectives come on and we want potentially to bring new task orders onto this contract. So um, the feasibility phase that is up front um, is only a small fraction, I would say, of the overall cost. It's again, um, all of these companies have prototypes that they already have in place and that they're working. Uh, the first feasibility phase is really about, you know, paper products and making sure we can get uh, to a place where NASA can understand how well they are meeting our requirements. Uh, so the first phase is really not a significant um, overall piece of that cost. Uh, the demonstration phase is quite a big chunk, and then of course, you know, 10 years of operating services as well. So um, I think hopefully that answered your question. All right, thank you, Laura. We'll now go to Jim Siegel with Florida Media Now. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for quite, uh, taking my uh, question. Um, I was actually going to ask a little bit about the pressurized system, so um, you've already answered that, Laura, but I, I did want to know from each one of the three awardees, uh, relatively how many people are going to be working on this project for, for each one of your uh, organizations? Are we talking about 10 or 15 or 500 or what uh, could you uh, could you speculate on what that might be thank you well i would say this first phase is is um, significantly limited as laura indicated where it's uh, really a feasibility of design and and design maturation to preliminary design review and so 
the way um, we strategized about that, we are certainly going to use all the team members to bring their talents to bear. Um, and with a um, half a dozen team members, uh, the numbers can climb pretty quickly. However, it's important that we uh, manage that team size effectively in the beginning and really understand, you know, what how we're meeting requirements and how we're meeting the safety needs and, and the reliability needs of, of uh, what NASA asked us before the team ramps up into the full development cycle. So you'll see a, a bell curve kind of shape in our manpower where we'll start out with a small team and then once we get into the full scale development for the demonstration mission, should we be fortunate enough to win that, uh, we will ramp up significantly to, to deliver that system. Awesome. Yeah, happy to chime in. Um, so our company, about 85 folks. Uh, we have 100 uh, that we're going to be at, at at the end of next quarter. But I will say we have the benefit of having truly amazing partners in Lockheed Martin, General Motors, Goodyear, MDA Space, and each one of those companies is, is a multi-billion dollar company that can throw serious resources at this. I will say, although our team is 85 people, we're 85 people that focus solely on mobility, robotic systems, for space and extreme environments. So we're throwing our entire team at this, everything we have, uh, and we will be bringing on more A-plus talent. Uh, so just a quick plug, if you want a job, <laughs> you know, it, shoot, us, shoot us your resume. We're always looking for really awesome people uh, here in Houston and also in Denver, Colorado. Yeah, we're, we're a similar scale to, to Lunar Outpost, um, and um, of course we also par have partners as well, uh, Axiom Space and Odyssey Space Research. So, uh, you know, in, in aggregate, um, I, there'll be in, certainly in excess of, of 100 in the first year working on this. Um, this is our sole focus of our, of our company. Um, we are developing our commercial platform um, regardless. So. We're we're all in on 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 this uh, solution, and um, and 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 so it's it's um, uh, you know similar to as you said. If we of course if we're awarded the demonstration mission, that will drive some growth as well. Um, but uh, our this is our entire focus, and we you know we look forward to to working closely with NASA and providing you know us, essentially um, that focus to, to this problem. All right, thank you, Jarrett. We're going to go to our last question on the phone bridge with Ryan Catton of NASA Space Flight Now. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm interested in the uh, remote slash uh, autonomous operations that were mentioned. Is, is that going to be purely for moving the vehicle between different landing sites, uh, or will they be able to host science payloads? And if they can host science payloads, are they going to be able to be like interchangeable by astronauts? Is it going to be more, or are they going to be uh, permanently fixed for just thinking of the Mars rovers that we currently have? Thank you. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And uh, the expectation is that we'll be able to host scientific payloads on the LTV and that we could use those payloads to conduct scientific research uh, between the time periods that the astronauts are there. Your, your question was focused on the telerobotic phase. Uh, so the goal is to be able to conduct research with astronauts, uh, move astronauts around, help them get to locations they wouldn't otherwise be able to reach, uh, and then to conduct uh, continued exploration and science after they've departed. So the payloads, uh, we, don't, we don't know what they are yet. We'll be working with um, our directorates across NASA to identify that. Uh, but the rovers themselves, and anybody else can, uh, can chime in here, uh, are likely to have a, a suite of sensors to help with a lot of that telerobotic activity. So they really will be exploring, uh, and that, that really goes hand in hand with science. It's collecting knowledge. It's learning about the environment. They'll conduct reconnaissance so that we know better how to move around in the future. You've heard them hinting about this, that, you know, the iterative build and steps to learn how to do this work. And the science knowledge is kind of a backbone that, that we have. And we, we talked earlier about the environment and how much we've learned about the environment over the last several decades. And this is just a continuation of that effort to continue learning. And the capabilities that we've requested for the vehicles are to be able to, to host those payloads and support the astronauts when they're there. Yeah, with our terrestrial prototype, uh, we've actually also built a two and a half meter long six degree of freedom robotic arm with a modular end effector. And that's allowed us over the last couple of years to 
practice doing science operations, deploying instruments, collecting samples, deploying infrastructure. Uh, and we, we do that routinely. We do it remotely as well, operating from our, our mission control center in, in uh, Hawthorne, California. Um, and so we're, uh, you know, we're already on that path to, to, to really um, get the most out of these vehicles in order to enhance the science return of the Artemis campaign. Yeah. Oh, you going to go soon? All right, Matt, happy to jump in. I think the, obviously the coolest thing about the LTVS uh, program is its contribution to the broader Artemis campaign, providing mobility for astronauts on the lunar surface, and, and, and that's number one. What's really exciting, though, is there are multiple other goals and objectives that we can solve with this platform, with this LTV, that are incredibly important to the sustainability of the new cislunar economy, whether it's building infrastructure on the moon, whether it's prospecting and sampling resources, or whether it's performing these enhanced science mission objectives uh, that uh, the NASA folks were just talking about. It really is a truly capable vehicle, and I'm really excited to see what this vehicle is going to do on the lunar surface. All right. Thank you so much. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you once again to all of our briefers for their time, and congratulations again to Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, and Astrolab. Uh, we do hope that you will continue to follow along with NASA's Artemis campaign at nasa.gov forward slash Artemis. Uh, that will wrap up today's briefing. We'll see you next time.